Hi, actually one of my nieces are out here. Hi. Um, I'm from the tribe here in St. Croix. How many of you guys know that there's a tribe nearby? Okay. How many of you guys know that there are more than this tribe in Wisconsin? Okay, gosh. How many of you know that there are 11 tribes in Wisconsin? What? Mr. <laughs> Olaf, you're doing an awesome job. What are you guys learning in? What are you, what's the t subject? Uh, just first people, like uh, pre-colonial type. Okay. Okay, yeah, we'll come on this day coming up and everything that makes sense. Um, but I'll save the questions for after, okay? But I want to introduce the, the speaker today, and it's really my pleasure to introduce her because she was one of my teachers growing up. Um, she's my auntie in the native way. Um, she's my mom's first cousin, so they're like sisters, so she's like my auntie. Um, but she knows a lot about the tradition, she knows a lot about the cultures. So guys, you're really going to enjoy her presentation. Um, I'm actually from the tribe. I was on the tribal council. We have our tribal people here today, too. Um, and so, without talking anymore, I want to bring up Marjorie Eagleman. Um, she's a very influential person in our community, and you guys will enjoy her presentation. How about a round of applause for her? students. Um, my name is Marjorie Eagleman and I'm here to talk about the history of the St. Croix Ojibwe Indians of Wisconsin. Our history began many, many years ago when before the white man came. We lived by the shores of the ocean in the east. It was prophesied that a light-skinned race would land on our shores of, on the shore and bring death and destruction to our people. After a, great count, after a great council, we started traveling westward according to the prophecies and followed the sign of a sacred vision along the way. The seven prophets came to the Ojibwe with instruction of life from the Creator. There were, so many, there were so many people that these words have been told through generations. The people were so many and powerful that if one was to climb the highest mountain and to look all directions, they would not be able to see the end of the Ojibwe nation. The seven stopping places began first to, the, to an island shaped like a turtle, an area known as the St. Lawrence River, present day Montreal. The second stopping place was Niagara Falls, from there they travel to what is today Lake Huron and Erie, traveling <coughs> westward and stopped when they came to a large body of water. This was in the eastern shores of Lake Michigan. Generation passed until the people were instructed to travel north. The second, the people stopped at a place where food grows upon the water, now known as Manitoulin Island. This became known as the capital of the Ojibwe nation. This was the fifth stopping place for the Ojibwe. The Ojibwe people split into two large groups. One followed the northern route, and the other followed the southern route. The northern group stayed on an island known as Spirit Island. The southern group settled here where they found the food that grows upon the water, wild rice believed to be the gift from Creator. This was the sixth stopping place for the Ojibwe people. One of the prophets had spoken of a turtle-shaped island at the end of their journey. The people returned to an to a settled to a settled wait no, to a, and settled on an island known as Madeline Island. The migration took 500 years to complete the, the journey, which began in 900 AD. Can you imagine how long that took for them to travel? It was during the migration of the Anishinaabe that the Ojibwe settled west along Lake Superior and north to Canada. The Ojibwe people's custom, cultural customs and lifestyles lifestyle were of the woodland surroundings. 
The Ojibwe people made their homes and supplies out of wood and bark. They lived in wigwams, but they, they traveled to different locations according to seasons. The Ojibwe people were hunters and trappers that became important in the fur trading industry with the French and the English. The trading industry relationship lasted for 50 years with the Dakota Ojibwe French until the French abandoned La Pointe founded on Madeline Island. The Ojibwe were forced to divide, to divide and seek a more plentiful land. One of the locations that the Ojibwe found was along the banks of the St. Croix River until the govern, government began seizing land in Wisconsin. In 1837, the Ojibwe were given the identity of the St. Croix Chippewa tribe of Wisconsin. In 1854, the St. Croix tribe no longer existed in the eyes of the government officials. The Ojibwe did not participate because the Ojibwe did not participate in the signing of a land treaty at La Pointe. This, would, this made the St. Croix tribe unable to seek land for a reservation that lasted for 80 years, and they became known as the Lost Tribe. In 1934, the St. Croix tribe were finally federally recognized, were finally a federally recognized tribe given reservation land due to the treaty called the Indian Re Re Organization Act. Today, the St. Croix Chippewa tribe in northern Wisconsin is, a scattered, is scattered in a checkerboard of 11 communities over a four county area. They are spread throughout Barron, Polk, Burnett, and Washburn counties. The St. Croix reservations are Balsam, Basha, Big Sand, and Big Round, Clem, and G Gaslin, and Pike Lake, and the Maple Plain Reservation. The tribal headquarters for the Ojibwe people is located in Burnett County Reservation of the of the community Big Sand Lake near a small town called Fertile. Um, some of these things that were used or um, that were sacred to the Ojibwe tribe or to the Ojibwe people were, um, it was called Kinnikinik, and this is Kinnikinik. Um, they used, um, this is the tobacco plant, and these plants grow really tall, they're really tall, and, and they use the leaves, and then also, um, this is called red willow, they would, um, they would peel the red bark, and then on, um, slowly take off the red bark, and then on the inside they would peel the white on the inside, and they would make, um, make the tobacco, this is their safe, this is our sacred tobacco. Right. So before we had kicks, right? Before we had Nikes, um, even people besides Indians had to find a way to cover their feet because it hurts, right? It hurts going across rocks and um, trees without something. So what we used was animal skin. It's called leather. I think a lot of ancient people used animal skin, um, and normally they were elk hide or something, you know, that was really strong that would protect their feet. And when the traders came in, when Europeans came over here to America and started trading with us, um, because when Europeans came here, um, they didn't have a lot of things. The ship journey was, I don't know, Mr. Olaf, maybe you can help ship journey maybe two months, three months from Europe to America. And this was the new world. And you guys have learned this was the new world. There was a lot of opportunity. They could come out from under Britain rule. And so they came over here. But their only problem was is that Natives were here, and so there were a lot of battles, but also 
when the Europeans got here, a lot of them didn't have food, didn't have uh, didn't have a lot of resources to survive until a lot of Europeans died here. But in order to have those skills, like we grew, natives grew corn, um, grew the tobacco plants. Um, we had a whole thriving economy here. And so to be part of that, the Europeans offered um, goods for us. In, in, in exchange for corn, maybe you, uh, the Europeans would give us um, a, I don't know how many, how many ounces <laughs> or, of beads. But we've never seen anything like this before. Right, these are little cut glass. Okay, we've never worked with glass before. And then we never seen them colored and they were so shiny. And so to us, this was really, really valuable because we could we could make our moccasins like this and we used designs. Because before beads, we had paint. And paint was made from the flowers that we had. It was the, it was like the waste of what we used. And so we made paste and we did paint. But now we had beads. And this was really, really valuable to us, along with um, cowrie shells. You guys know what cowrie shells are? Right, they come from the ocean. They're little snails, um, little mussels that wash up. And we used those too, and they traded those with us in conch shells. So these are what um, we used on our feet, which just got really, really decorative with them. Oh, and baby moccasins. They made little baby moccasins and um, they were worn, um, they were given uh, moccasins um, four days after they were born and they would, um, their tradition was to um, um, put three little holes on the bottom for their, um, so, they could, so they wouldn't split. Oh, it's like that. And these are, and they're different, right? So this is a little more of a cultural thing, but see how the moccasins are different? These are Ojibwe, well, these are woodland moccasins, yeah. I have to say, because other tribes have to make our moccasins like this too. And this is more of a style thing, but these are woodland moccasins, so the tribes that are around here. And these are like plains moccasins. So these are like um, Sue and Cheyenne, who um, actually live in the, in the plains area. And actually, this land that you're on here now was originally Dakota land. Do you guys know who the Dakota are? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so like Sitting Bull, right? The great chiefs, you know, the ones who, who fought a lot. Um, this was their land. And when we came over, when March talked about the migrating from the, the East Coast, we actually originated up by Nova Scotia. We came down the St. Lawrence River, we made that big journey, and we came to where the creator said, there is food that grows on the water, which is brown rice. When we got here, there were already people here. There were the Dakota people here. And so we had a lot of wars, and we have a lot of um, songs and stories that go with those wars that we had to fight to, to have this land because it was so fertile, right? So when you go out to the Dakotas, there's not a whole lot there. And really, no one wants to live there. We'd rather live here where we can grow things and be safe. And it's not so hot and there are trees. Um, so we have to fight for that. But, speaking of the Plains people, and this is a little more decorative, um, the bee work that when we traded for bees, we traded our food for beads, um, our skins for beads, and in this area, fur trading was a big deal. Um, the French were very prominent in this area, um, and so we traded um, like otters' tails. Did, did any of your parents ever talk about going trapping? Nope. Okay, so they go out and they trap um, bears. Well, bears. The yeah. Bears. Yeah, beavers. Okay. Um, but then they skin those animals, right? I don't know if your parents do it, but what we did was we used the animals for food, um, for whatever else that their bodies could be used for. And then we skin them and tan their, their pelts. And those were very, very valuable to the French um, people who came around here, and that's what we traded for. But these are kind of neat. These are bugle bees, just other things that, that we use with the bees. Some of the other materials that was used was the, um, like the birch bark, and they would make birch bark baskets out of the uh, trees. So you guys know what birch trees are, right? Okay, so in the spring, is it in the spring or summer? Okay, so in the spring, the the, the um, 
the trees are a little too hard, right? They're still frozen from the winter. But when the summer months came on, um, you could actually take. Okay, so if this was a birch bark, if this was a birch tree, you can cut the outside layer and then peel it off. And that's what we did in the summer. And that was kind of a, a women's thing to do, was to go out and to get the birch off the tree. And if you soak, okay, bark. So if you feel this, let's pass this around, okay? Is that okay, my mm -hmm. Okay, so if you feel this, it's hard. Pass that one here. Okay, so it's hard now, but if you work it, if you just take, peel the bark off the tree, it's going to be pretty tough like this. But if you soak it for a long time, and I don't know how long because I've actually worked with bridge bark, but if you soak it for a while, it becomes pliable, and you can shape it into, you know, this is decorative, this is a canoe. Um, but you can shape it into those things, and then this is actually part of the bark too. And I don't know which part of the bark it is, but if you peel it into little um, threads, you can either braid it or twist it into like this, this big thread, and that's what holds it all together. Now, can you imagine, I never knew this, but these birch bark um, baskets, we actually made bowls out of, and somehow they used them to cook, like boil water in, and I don't know how it was done, but over a fire, okay, I don't know how our ancestors did it, but they found a way to use those for cooking pots because we didn't have um, steel, we didn't have metal, we didn't have all of it. It was strictly um, anything that came off the land. And another thing we made out of birch bark were whole canoes. This is a little bitty one, but a whole canoe made out of birch bark that floated on the water that, you know, a lot of men could sit in and it didn't it didn't sink, and that's always baffled me too. Um, and some people, and it's become an art now because we don't really use the canoes anymore because we have dugout canoes or um, aluminum Gosh. ones, yeah, or aluminum ones or boats that we go out on the, uh, the water with. Plastic. Kayaks, oh my god, yes. But um, it's become an art now, and some people still do it. Um, and that's what March does is cultural preservation. It's, making sure these arts aren't lost. Oh, just in And then also, like, for when they had, like, when there was, like, tradition, I'm just gonna skip Like, when the men would go out hunting, or, you know, and they would make, uh, the women would make, like, coaches. Um, um, some of the, um, <coughs> Um, they make like the breech cloths, the leggings, a vest, anything that, because they used everything. They didn't waste waste anything. They found ways to um, to make to uh, use everything that they um, that they that, that was like given to them. And this is a pouch. You can either you know you can put your tobacco in there or you can. Um, Whatever is valuable, you could put it inside this, or either they could be worn on a, on a side as a man would wear it. Yeah, so a lot of decorative things. And this is a yarn belt, and again from the trade, because we never had textiles. Um, so it was just animal skins that we wore primarily. But as Europeans started coming in, um, then we could get more decorative with our with our daily wear, with our ceremonial dress, like what Marge just held up, um, with our um, our formal attire, like when people got married, then it could get really, really fancy. And that's where you started seeing the colors come in. And here for the woodland people, especially Ojibwe, these are these are pretty, I don't want to say common, but they're pretty special. It's a yarn belt. And this didn't come until after the Europeans, but um, learning how to weave them together to make a belt. And um, in our ceremonies today, um, yarn belts are, are hmm, they're more decorative, but they're pretty commonplace in, in our ceremonies. So here's the, um, like the Navajo, like the rug weaving, right? But we use yarn to make, to make belts, and the designs can get pretty fancy. So 
now I'd like to show you this. Um, this is a cradle board. This is what they would um, put the babies in when the babies were born. Um, the women, um, uh, this is called a, uh, uh, a noggin in Ojibwe. And they would put their baby in there and they would have like the cloth uh, uh, to wrap the baby up. And the mother was able to um, do um, um, things, um, uh, how, uh, chores, mm -hmm. chores, or, or um, and be able to put the baby, like maybe some place where the baby would be safe, you know, put them against like maybe a tree or, you know, so, so the baby would stay safe. And also the baby, when they wrap the baby up in, in, the, um, in the cloth that they wrap, wrap them up in, they um, used to say that the baby's legs would um, be straight, so the baby's um, would grow um, strong and um, they would learn um, discipline that way um, by being able to um, uh, be still. cedar in I'd say maybe about uh, five days. I have a question. Um, sometimes we do get to have a powwow at the high school, mm -hmm. but um, our younger kids, I think especially, don't really kind of understand all the different parts or, you know, the different um, roles different people play. So could somebody just kind of give them an overview? At a powwow? Yes. For in particular? Yes. So the dances is what mainly yeah. you're... Yeah, okay. so there are some songs and some dances that are performed and... Um, Ooh, yeah, I wish we would have brought some... We have a lot of dancers in our tribe too. You guys, who's all been to the powwow here at school? 
Why not? Like Canoes there, birch bark. And what about the dugout ones? Um, those were made from different styles of trees. Again, you've got to look at your woods and what's the harder wood, what's the most pliable wood, what's easy to carve out. Um, canoes were pretty much all made out of cedar, some pine, and a lot of birch bark. And uh, pine, pine pick is what they sealed it with. Okay, we'll come back to you both. Um, did you do like any celebrations for Christmas? No. Um, that's a European, a Christian holiday, and um, most natives, well, all of the natives when the Europeans came here were not Christians. That was a totally foreign thing to us. Uh, we had a lot of our traditional beliefs, and that's what um, Marjorie helps the tribe remember and, and continue to do. Um, so when the, actually it was the missionaries who came over first to America, well, maybe the Vikings first, but the missionaries were some of the first people, your first Europeans to come here. And they started, they brought the Christian religion with them, and a lot of our native people became Christian, either by choice or most of the time by force, so it's not, it's not a good history for the natives. Um, but we have something called the Native American Church these days. Um, and now, because it's such a cool holiday and we like giving presents to each other, we do some great Christmas. Okay. Um, yeah. um, are there any special things? Lacrosse. Um, who knows what lacrosse is? Isn't it a cool sport? Okay. Yes. I've never, I, I never knew so much about it, but that's what our people played here was lacrosse. And we still have some of those um, tournaments today, and there are people who make the lacrosse sticks um, on their own. I don't know what they make them out of. Animal skin and maybe some, some wood. Yes, I think they play with oh. yeah. bendable materials. So yeah. that would probably be like the pine and also too, I think. Yeah. Um, were there any other games we played? Oh, moccasin games, right. Um, moccasin games is like, um, is that where you're guessing which is? Okay, so it's just like a guessing game. We have all our moccasins lined up and we put um, something underneath, but you have to guess. Which one? The sticks. Yeah. sticks. Yeah. And also the bone mm -hmm. yeah. the with the bones, the deer bones. And then we the, 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 the long bones. And then we the boots. The boots. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
carry a lot of copper because we're considered the keepers of the water. And we drink water out of these vessels to uh, just to remember our history and to remember that treaty that uh, this came from. So um, a lot of medicine people that I know uh, always have copper with them. So this, these were gifted to me and my grandson uh, years ago. So when we go into ceremonies, we use these copper vessels to drink water out of. Um, can we um, look at it and pass it on? Oh, sure. Sorry. <laughs> Um, did they ever eat any apples? 
apples? Well, yeah, I know we did, but I don't know if that was native to this area. I can tell you that was there. But we did. Um, what fruits were native to this area? Come on, Doug, if you want to expand on that. Um, berries. Berries. Well, a lot of berries. Yes. Berries. Uh, hazelnuts. Um, well, you know, with all of the vegetables and everything that we had. Um, I'm trying to think of all. I would say primarily berries, though. Yeah. Strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries. Your hands off the last three questions. Okay. Sundance, Kira, and Josh. Okay. Josh. Okay. So, Sundance? Did you guys walk or did you guys like ride horses? We, yeah, like yeah. Horses didn't come here until the Spaniards came in the 1400s. What kind of tools? Uh, like Wanda said, tools were made out of animal bones because if you file them and out of um, rocks, like flints, right? If you file them so much, they can really, really sharp. That's what we use for our tools. What ocean did you live next to? Atlantic. Nova Scotia is kind of my name. Um, sorry, that's it. Uh, let's give another round of applause. Thank you.